Yes, good boy. What a good dog. Yes. Oh, that's a good dog. Yes. Nicely done. Today on This American Land, early explorers couldn't believe their eyes, and neither will you. A New Mexico recreation area that's also a scientific treasure. This poisonous water had percolated into our groundwater. In Central California, extracting valuable fossil fuels is leaving foul water in its path. Our oceans may have some answers to dwindling energy supplies. We'll catch a wave of a promising renewable. All this and more now on This American Land. Funding for This American Land provided by The Weiss Foundation The Turner Foundation The Daniel K. Thorne Foundation The Pew Charitable Trusts Hello, and welcome to This American Land. I'm Caroline Ravel. And I'm Bruce Burkhart. On every show, we're going to take you to some of the most beautiful places you may never have heard of. And we'll do something more. We'll bring you thoughtful stories about America's natural heritage. We have reporters coast to coast covering water, wildlife, and conservation issues. We'll also introduce you to some of the people finding innovative ways to protect our resources for the future. Our first story is about a new federally protected recreation area in New Mexico. It's not only a breathtakingly bizarre site underground, but also a mysterious place that may hold clues to curing diseases and understanding life on other planets. A cave known as Snowy River. A jewel of New Mexico. A place where if Billy the Kid was resurrected, he would recognize it from the time that he last saw it. Rolling hills, a little bit of mountains, a river, green, very pretty. Among these mountains in southern New Mexico lies Fort Stanton Snowy River National Conservation Area. Once home to Billy the Kid, occupied by both Union and Confederate armies, the Buffalo Soldiers and the Apache Mescalero tribe, its history and culture are rich. Today, it remains largely as it existed 150 years ago, offering new opportunities above and below ground. It's a huge area for recreation. That includes everything from trails, like for horses, mountain bikes, hikers, to our caving program, which is also a huge part of our resource here. Directly beneath this postcard New Mexico landscape is Fort Stanton Cave, an obscure recreational caving site since the 1960s. But signs of human visitation date back to the Civil War. And recently, hints of even earlier visitors have been discovered. Uh, we've recently found evidence of where cane torches are being uh, hit on the ceiling like a mammoth cave, only here the fragments have stuck into the mud. So we actually are going to be able to get a rated carbon date one of these days. But perhaps the most intriguing feature of Fort Stanton was discovered in 2001 when spelunkers investigating signs of additional caves revealed Snowy River Passage. His comment was something to the effect of, how in the blankety blank blank are we going to deal with this? And of course, those that were behind him uh, said, what? What is it? He said, I don't know. It looks like a snowy river. And that's how Snowy River got its name. Snowy River is now considered the longest calcite formation in the world, with almost 17 miles of cave passages documented and no end in sight. This natural wonder has turned out to be a scientific gold mine. They're doing science that hasn't been done before, or it has been done before, but it, they're doing modifications of it and improvements on it, and uh, just really amazing work. Newly discovered bacteria at Snowy River are helping scientists understand possible life on other planets, as well as new cures for disease. It's also an opportunity to study how humans impact underground environments, and the findings have resulted in a more holistic approach to managing public lands. When we do uh, management actions on the surface, we know that what we do up here is going to infiltrate into cave passages below. And what goes into cave passages will eventually come up someplace in groundwater, well water, springs. 
a fragile, interconnected, and now protected landscape. It's like a storybook. You can essentially peel back the layers of time in this cave, like pages in a book, and read the history of the hydrology and the climate of the region. Think a GPS device is just for getting around town? Scientists are using the same technology to track some endangered bighorn sheep in the harsh and desolate mountain habitats where they're found. Gary Stryker has our story. Researcher Ali Kordamash starts her workday on skis. That's how she gets around on the alpine terrain where she studies the Teton Range bighorn sheep herd. Using GPS devices and trail counters, she tracks the movements of both sheep and skiers. We really want to get a better sense of how bighorn sheep survive in the Tetons, both summer and winter. We don't know very much about this bighorn sheep herd. It's really small um, and really hard to study because they're so remote and hard to observe. While other wild sheep move down to more moderate terrain, this herd winters at some of the highest elevations in Wyoming. They stopped migrating about 60 years ago due to human development, fire suppression, and other factors. From a conservation biology standpoint, they are on the brink, and there's three primary reasons for that. One of them is the small size. It's a very small herd of sheep, about 100 total. The other is that they winter at high elevation in extremely rigorous conditions where there's very little to eat. And then the third thing is they're isolated from other sheep herds, meaning there's not very much genetic interchange. Of 28 sheep researchers have been following for two years, seven have died. Four of those seven have died in avalanches, which is interesting because historically when the sheep used to migrate down into the valleys, they wouldn't have to deal with avalanches in the wintertime. Hi, you guys going backcountry skiing today or just cross country? Researchers also track backcountry skiers to see how they interact with the sheep. Jackson Hole Mountain Resort, a gateway to the backcountry, is cooperating. We operate uh, in the midst of what's likely one of the most intact natural uh, environments that is actually uh, inhabited by humans. And we take our environmental responsibility very, very seriously. Our guides, in fact, have taken some of the GPS units and been tracked. Resort guide Bill Anderson carries a GPS while showing clients the pristine backcountry surrounding the resort. When you're out every day and you seldomly see these creatures, it's really unique and interesting to come across them. Some areas are off limits to skiers to protect these bighorns. The study offers an opportunity to see how effective those closures are and a chance to discover how these wild sheep, residing here since the last ice age, still survive despite their diminished range. For This American Land, I'm Gary Stryker. Ram's horns can weigh more than 40 pounds and often show broken tips from clashes over females. We all know how a dog's keen sense of smell can sniff out survivors at a disaster site or drugs at an airport. What you might not know is that working dogs can also be useful in the field to conservationists and scientists. Time now to meet some four-legged naturalists on the hunt for rare plants and invasive species. Our story comes from Oregon Public Broadcasting. Good boy. Oh, what a This is Sabo. He's a seven-year-old German Shepherd, and he's been working as a conservation dog for five years. And what we're doing here is research on whether dogs could be beneficial in helping researchers to find a rare plant. Oh, good boy, what a good dog, yeah! Dog olfaction is not really thoroughly understood, but everything has a scent. And through the training, they are trained to recognize the specific compounds that make up the target. So in this case, Kincaid's lupin. Yes, good boy, what a good dog! And so they're ignoring all other plants that are growing in the same environment and targeting the Kincaid's lupin because they were trained only on that. 
And it is such a different reality for dogs. They use their nose, not their eyes. And I think the, the easiest way to explain it is if we were to measure our scenting ability, people's, it's like the size of a postage stamp. And a dog's scenting ability is like this big. It'd be a giant poster board. And the reason the dog is doing the work is not because they like to smell plants. It's because they want their reward. And the reward is generally a, a ball or a toy. They want their toy and they want to interact with the handler. So the minute they come in contact with the scent, the ball comes out. Yes, good boy, what a good dog. Yes, oh, that's a good dog, yes. Nicely done, oh, I got it, I got this. I think probably every day that I'm working a dog, I, I learn something new. For instance, out here, you know, there's plants of all different kinds of species. And the fact that the dog's able to work through this kind of environment and find a plant that's only a couple of inches high and maybe a couple of inches wide it always amazes me. And, you know, it's a thrill. It's like, well, what a good dog. I can't believe you did that. Good boy. What a good dog. Good boy. Many of the dogs used for conservation work are rescued from shelters. Some of them have a little too much energy to keep in a family home. Quick, think of some top destinations for scuba diving. Key West, Maui, I bet Oklahoma isn't on your list. Well, maybe it ought to be. Oklahoma Department of Wildlife Conservation takes us on an underwater adventure. You know, Oklahoma has blessed us with a tremendous diversity of different types of, of waterscapes around the state. Fortunately, one of my co-workers, game warden Brandon Brown from Marshall County, has discovered through the lens of his video camera a whole new world lurking underneath Oklahoma's waters. I've been diving since uh, I was a teenager. In fact, uh, I worked as a commercial diver offshore for several years before I went to work for the department. I, I first got into streams when I was in college. Uh, I wanted to be an ichthyologist to study fish my whole life. And then when I got an ichthyology class, I was pretty disappointed because I found out that ichthyology was about looking at little pale fish in glass jars. And I thought, man, what a waste of time. Like, here I am looking at these little colorless minnows. And then we went on our first field trip down to the Blue River. And uh, the first St. Hall, we pulled up orange throated darters. And it was the first time I'd ever seen them. And I thought, my goodness, you know, I can't believe that these things are living in these streams just 40 miles from my house. Been here my whole life, and I didn't even know they existed. So from that point on, I, I just became really interested in streams and stream fish. And I got into uh, underwater photography or video uh, as a way of sharing uh, that experience with other people. The simplest way to get into this is just a simple mask and a snorkel. Uh, pretty inexpensive, you can pick one up anywhere. You can see my mask, the strap broke, I just put a bungee cord on it. And this is really all you need. Uh, if you want to do underwater photography or videography, you can start out with one of these little flip cameras. Uh, pretty inexpensive still. Uh, store the media on an SD card. If you have good light and clear water and you can get close, you'd really be surprised the, the quality you can get on, on something like this. They don't make very many underwater video cameras, so most video cameras have to have a housing. This is a pretty basic housing. It's pretty simple. Basically, it just keeps your camera dry. Uh, housings are rated by their depth. Uh, this one's only good to about 20 feet. They have housings that go all the way down to, uh, say, maybe 300 feet. You never know what you're gonna see. Every single time I've ever gone underwater with a video camera, I've seen something new, every time. Whether it's a snake, a, a beaver, uh, a turtle, you just never know what's gonna happen. This was uh, something I didn't expect to get. I was actually trying to film pupfish and a flock of ducks came in and landed and they're feeding on the bottom here in about 25 foot of water. They let me get within about 50 or 60 feet of them. I think it turned out pretty good. Really everything that you want to see, at least in Oklahoma, you can uh, see in water shallow enough to stand up in. You can literally sit on a riffle on the Barren Fork River and see maybe 15 or 20 different species uh, within a five or 10 minute period in one spot in just a couple feet of water. It, 
indicates that you have a really healthy environment. Uh, everything has a niche, it has a role that it fills uh, in nature, and to have a stream with high diversity usually indicates that you've got a pretty good quality system. Uh, everything is in balance. We find different fish associated with different habitat. Of course, the habitat changes pretty much from east to west. Generally speaking, in the eastern half of the state, we have the highest diversity. These clear gravel bottom streams in the northeast, you walk up to the creek and you look in a pool and you say, man, there's, there's no fish in there. But if you put that mask on and look underwater, this, this is what you see. There's a whole world down there that, that a lot of people are missing out on. As habitat diversity increases, so does species diversity. And some of the streams in uh, central Oklahoma, Blue River, uh, and then the northeast part of the state, it just really is amazing the variety of fish you can see. I've traveled all over the state and even out of state. My wife and I, it seems like uh, all of our vacations anymore seem to revolve around my filming or seining a creek somewhere. I'm able to go to the creek to film what I see and then take it back and share it with other people. And a really enjoyable process. So whether it's above the water surface or below the water, we hope that we've inspired you to get out and discover for yourself what awaits you in outdoor Oklahoma. Lake Tenkiller in eastern Oklahoma is a popular scuba destination. Located in the foothills of the Ozark Mountains, visibility in parts of this clear lake can be up to 35 feet. Everyone now appreciates that there's a limited amount of fossil fuels on our planet. Energy companies are drilling deeper and using riskier techniques to retrieve every possible drop of oil. And there's a controversial drilling method that uses superheated water pumped into thick oil deposits to loosen the oil for pumping to the surface. This mix of oil and water is causing problems for California's Central Valley, as Gary Stryker reports. A few hours north of Los Angeles, near Bakersfield in California's Central Valley, oil drillers and farmers live side by side. But some farmers aren't happy with the consequences. When his almond trees died after he irrigated them with groundwater, Fred Starr sued neighboring Era Energy for polluting the water, and he won. This poisonous water had percolated into our groundwater. Kern County's oil fields account for about 8% of all oil produced in the United States. And the oil here is thick and heavy. Part of our oil field here is 12 gravity oil. It's, it's about like the consistency of liver in the meat case. And to make that thick oil more fluid, they pull water from the California aqueduct, convert it to steam, and inject it into the ground through pipes. Pump steam down it for like seven days, then I'll let it soak for seven days. We put the equivalent of 1.4 million barrels of water converted to steam in the ground a day. Oil loosened by steam is pumped out. Not pure crude oil, but a watery mix. It all comes out of the ground through this flow line, through these lines here, up into the, tank, up into the tanks. At the tanks, oil and water are separated. The oil is sold, but the tainted water must be disposed of separately. Every day, hundreds of thousands of barrels of this so-called produced water are pumped into unlined open pits, raising concerns that this potentially hazardous water is seeping into the ground. Oversight of this process is conducted by the State Water Resources Control Board. Our responsibility is to protect water quality in the Central Valley region. At this time, we believe there are about 1,000 to 1,200 ponds in the southern San Joaquin Valley. We haven't taken the time to sit down and count exactly how many ponds we have. Does it contain constituents that we're concerned about that could impact water quality? Yes. Yes, it does. That's why it's regulated. But some, like Fred Starr, question the effectiveness of the state's regulation. ERA also had documents that indicated that they knew it was moving on to our ground as well. 
They drilled a thousand wells the next year and a thousand wells the following year more. Right now we have between 80 and 100 sites that are actively undergoing cleanup activities that include monitoring. In Fresno, one to two people are working on oil field related activities. Do you feel like you're getting the job done that you need to get done? We're doing it to the best of our ability. We are doing the job to the best of our ability with the resources that are available to us. The oil companies say they recycle most of their wastewater and that their operations avoid contaminating freshwater aquifers. But until California's resources match the requirements of oversight, there's no way to know the effect that oil byproducts are having on the Central Valley's groundwater. For This American Land, I'm Gary Stryker. Oil accounts for 40% of total energy demands in the U.S. and 99% of fuel for the country's cars and trucks. All of the problems associated with fossil fuels are driving scientists and engineers around the world to develop energy alternatives. While solar and wind power may be the best known, there's also an endless supply of power in the ocean. In our Science Nation report, Miles O'Brien has more on the efforts to harness the ocean's energy. So what we're looking at here is the deployment of our 11th wave energy buoy. Power from clean and constant ocean waves could help solve the world's energy problems. And there must be a way that we can extract that energy efficiently, in a survivable way, in a maintainable way, in a reliable way. But it hasn't always been easy to generate support for this renewable source. In 1998, when I was writing these white papers and proposals, people were saying, you know, she's crazy. Uh, we're not gonna be able to harness uh, energy from the ocean, it's just too harsh of an environment. Before this successful field test off the Oregon coast. Oscilloscopes and function generators and contactors and circuit breakers. Electrical engineer Annette Von Juan experimented with many technologies. This is a linear to rotary system and these were two of those top five that we built at the 200 watt level. This was like our, our third prototype and it is a permanent magnet rack and pinion system. With support from the National Science Foundation, Von Juan developed many wave energy devices, realizing the simpler, the better. This design has few moving parts. A magnetic shaft is anchored by a cable to the seafloor. An electrical coil is secured to a heaving buoy. You have this magnet assembly heaving up and down in the waves, creating this changing magnetic field and direct conversion of that linear heaving motion of the wave into electrical energy. In the lab, they can mimic the harsh ocean environment. Our collaborations with the utilities in the Pacific Northwest have been excellent. Part of it is we reached out early on and shared this untapped potential. They're also designing systems to minimize harm to marine mammals. We do have off the Oregon coast about 20,000 whales that migrate. So we have experts who are also looking at acoustic avoidance systems that are encouraging the whales to go around these wave installations. Experts say wave energy might one day supply up to 6% of U.S. energy needs and in a very reliable way. Wave power is available 80 to 90% of the time, twice that of wind or solar. Fortunately, we are in a climate that people understand the importance of renewable energy technologies. So clean ocean energy may be the wave of the future. For Science Nation, I'm Miles O'Brien. The U.S. Department of Energy is providing $37 million in funding for MHK, that's marine and hydrokinetic technologies that could generate renewable electricity from oceans, 
rivers and streams. The 27 projects being funded range from concept studies and design research to actual in-water device testing with projects in both the east and west coast. Government energy experts say ocean waves, tides, currents, thermal gradients and free-flowing rivers represent a promising energy source located close to centers of electricity demand. One of the stories we're working on for a future show, cattle rustling, really? Well, believe it or not, it's still a huge crime in the 21st century. I can't believe that's still around. I know. Well, thanks for joining us for This American Land. It's a place where you'll find original stories affecting America's natural landscapes, waters, and wildlife. We'll see you next time. For more information about this program, visit thisamericanland.org. Funding for This American Land provided by The Weiss Foundation The Turner Foundation The Daniel K. Thorne Foundation The Pew Charitable Trusts